As a writer, words are my material as much as, say, a builder uses bricks and a carpenter uses wood. And I can thank my dad for that. One of the things I inherited from him was this book, the Oxford Dictionary of English Etymology, and his voice forever in my head shouting, look it up. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Dad was a writer too, but he had to leave school at 14, so he really did look it up. And that's why I treasure this book so much. Some of you may get the reference, but it truly sparks joy in me. Because when I search for a word, I sometimes wonder if I'm following the exact same trails as my dad did. It reminds me of how important words were for him. And as a self-educated man, he never had a lu the luxury of taking them for granted. Some facts. The average English speaker knows apparently only 40,000 words of the 171,000 available. And of those, we'll use 20,000. So that's just 11% which means that the words all of us are using matter, especially as they are constantly changing. And that's the joy of it for me. You've probably guessed I'm a bit of a word geek, but I love it when I find a word that still has a flavor of its original recipe, recipe from prescription to take. So as an example, to take the root spec to look, it's easy to see where you get spectacles and spectator, but look a bit further and you have respect to look up. And from a word we don't use anymore, despect, to look down, you get despise, in spite of, spiteful, and so it goes on. But with words constantly changing and growing, each new edition of the dictionary can't hope to contain them all. And we heard earlier and very beautifully from John of the consequences, real consequences, of some of the nature words being left out of the Oxford Junior Dictionary. But what interests me is that it was the dictionary that took the blame. And actually, it should have been us. Because a dictionary will only ever use the words from contemporary sources, from the words that we are using every day, even from our tweets. So it can only ever be following us. And a nice link in Tunbridge Wells, down the road, we have a plaque to Henry Fowler. He was one of the people that worked on the first ever Oxford English Dictionary, which took 44 years to compile. I must confess, I sometimes have to resist curtsying before I pass this plaque. And as I live in Mount Zion, <laughs> that is quite hard. <laughs> But I digress to step to walk. I say that it's us that should take the blame for the words missing from the children's dictionary, because how many more times in an average week do you use broadband over bluebell? I know I do. But what if being active and conscious about the words we are using, such as otter, conquer, kingfisher, all words that were lost from that dictionary, is something positive we can do for the next generation. An inheritance as solid as, say, a house, a nest egg, or this book from my dad. When I was Canterbury Laureate, uh, one of my very favorite projects was to ask people what their five favorite words were. I was amazed at how personal and therefore powerful those words were. They came from particular landscapes, from uh, jobs, hobbies, obsessions, family language, family languages. Here are some of those words. And when I compare those to a list of what are apparently the most beautiful words in the English language, atonement, wherewithal, woebegone, um, I think these are like supermodels 
Well, for a start, they're very long, but they're also lovely to look at. And I personally don't want to stand too close to them, <laughs> or indeed anyone that uses Wobegon a lot. <laughs> but if someone tells me their favorite words, and they're more ordinary, for example, uh, hedgerow, fiddlesticks, pudding, gin, um, cake, <laughs> I get a real clear picture of that person. And that's why I think it's the ordinary, overlooked, everyday words that can actually give us as good a, an idea of a person, a people, and an age, as much as, say, a photograph or a news headline. And talking of which, Dictionaries produce a word of the year, as you may know. It could have been worse, like thinking about last year, but from a short list which contained a stunning 98 words, all beginning with self, self-obsessed much, the winner of the Oxford English Dictionary Word of the Year for 2018 was, I don't know if people know, toxic. Toxic chemicals, toxic relationships, toxic masculinity, toxic politics. So despite that, despite from despect to look down, I've written a poem for you, which uses the words of the year from the last nine years. The one for 2015 was particularly challenging, as you'll uh, see, but in true writerly fashion, I've left that to the end. But before I read it, I wanted to ask you whether you are as uncomfortable as I am in having a whole year of our lives summed up by that one word, toxic. It's a real example to me of how the words we use but don't think about can actually have an impact. So I wanted to invite you over the next year um, I won't be coming around to check, it's all right, to compile your personal dictionaries of your five words that you would like to pass on. But also you may want to think of the one word you would like to sum up the coming year. And, and this is important, to actually use it, not just wish it so. So here's the poem. The words and their year will come up behind. Icarus vapes over a dictionary. The weather was post-truth that summer. We lounged in our gardens, took selfies in lycra. <laughs> Those sunny Sundays, even us squeezed middles could imagine ourselves gods with music blasting through walls and us dancing. It was a rest from the omni-shambles of so many toxic headlines. And if sometimes we looked up, it was in the hope that it might never end. Or perhaps we were waiting for the promised youthquake that would finally build us a big society. That term, many of us still liked the sound of, but few had ever understood, if we were completely honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>